All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Lasting Learning. So glad you're here because this week you are in for an extra special treat. We have a woman on who pushes me and inspires me almost daily. When I read the stuff that she is up to, the ideas that she has and just the way that she empowers the learners and the leaders um, in her district, it pushes me to get better and do better every single day. She is a creator, she's an innovator, she's a leader, former teacher, former principal, former reading coach, she's an author, she's a speaker, she is just absolutely amazing. Today, we've got Dr. JC Maslick here with us. JC, thank you so much for being here. Hi Dave, thanks for having me. Absolutely, so, so JC, you are up to a ton, obviously. Um, hanging out in Pennsylvania, just changing the world. Can you just introduce yourself to the people that might not know you and if my introduction left anything out, fill in those gaps? Yeah, absolutely. So you're right, uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The school district that I work in is about 30 miles northwest of the city, um, but born and raised in Pittsburgh, lived here all my life, and uh, Pittsburgh is kind of a cool place to live. It, it is really a, a hotbed for, like you mentioned, creativity and innovation. It's a great cultural center, and it has allowed me to really live and learn and work here, and it's been been wonderful. Um, I started my career as a classroom teacher. I taught mostly kindergarten and first grade in a pretty large public school system. Uh, we looped, so I kept my kids for K and one, uh, which I think is kind of a unique thing. That, that was kind of a, a thing of the 90s. Um, but I loved that opportunity to stay with kids for, for multiple years. Um, that sort of also drove my interest in literacy. Uh, when you're teaching little ones those early literacy skills, it just made me want to learn more as an educator. So I went back to school and got my reading specialist certificate and kind of pursued that a little bit in a, another school district. Um, you'll, you'll get this theme here. I just keep going back to school all the time. <laughs> so I was doing this literacy coaching work and I thought, oh, well, coaching teachers is kind of cool. Maybe I want to go back to school again and I'm going to get my principal certificate. Uh, so I did that, and I spent 10 years as an elementary school principal uh, in a wonderful K-6 through six building. Uh, I, I tell people I think that was probably one of the best jobs in the world. Uh, I loved having my own building. I loved my teachers. We had wonderful parents, and our students were rock stars. It was just a great, great place to be. Um, it allowed me the chance to really learn a lot there as well. Um, but as with most things, you know, uh, a time comes where you're just wanting a little bit more and so I again went back to school and um, that has led me to the job that I'm in right now as an assistant superintendent and uh, you know Dave being in a similar role all that is code for is all the stuff gets piled on your plate it's anything anybody else doesn't want to do here you go assistant superintendent um, so I do a curriculum and instruction assessment technology, professional development, all, all that good stuff. Um, but it's also the fun stuff. Um, you know, I get to spend time with teachers and visiting classrooms and working on initiatives that are, are really making a difference for our kids. And, and that's the, the best part of my job. That's the part I love the most. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I honestly think that the job that I have that we have right now, it's really that sweet spot. We get to go out and just give people permission to do all the fun stuff. And then when it all fails, we get to sit back and everybody goes to complain to somebody else. So it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's fun. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff involved, but it's all the fun stuff. It really is. There's no shoe tying and nose blowing. It's just go out there and play, guys. Have fun. I think that's so important, though. You said permission. I, I feel like that's something that I talk to people about a lot. Um, when I came to the school district that I'm in right now, that needed to happen. We needed to have a lot of conversations around, hey, it's okay to try this. And I don't care if it fails. I, I actually hope it fails because I think we learn a lot more from our failures than we necessarily do from our successes. Um, but in our role, in any leadership role really, being able to say, hey, look, I give you permission to try this. I, I give you permission to go outside the box and think differently about something and see what happens in your classroom. I really feel like that's what makes some of the best teachers. It's those ones who are willing to take a risk, to take a chance, and sometimes they just need somebody, somebody above them to say, go for it, I got gotcha. you, you can do this. 
I, I couldn't agree more. Um, but I've got to ask you, where in the world that mindset came from? Because uh, for some for people that haven't been to Pittsburgh before, Pittsburgh, first of all, is an amazing, it's an amazing city, an amazing community, amazing area. But you are surrounded by mountains. You've got to go through all these tunnels to get there. It's almost like a fortress. You know, it, it's not it's not like it's a it's a place where all roads go through Pittsburgh. It it is a place that is, I would say, somewhat isolated, but very cosmopolitan. Um, so I'm wondering, somebody that's been born and raised there, how did you get yourself to this place where you're willing to embrace and accept that there are other ways to do things? You know, my own experience, I've been, I've worked in seven different districts. So I feel like it's just natural for me to pick up and do a lot of different things because I've been exposed to a lot of different things. Do you know where your inquisitive, curious, let's just try something new mindset came from? I mean, I think some of it came from my parents, right? I mean, I just always was a thinker and an explorer. So I think some of it comes naturally. Um, but one thing that I, I talk about often is this wonderful gift we have in Pittsburgh. It's an organization called Remake Learning. And if you don't know Remake Learning, look them up, check out their website. They are literally a, a group of connectors. They connect schools with out of school. Uh, with higher ed, with museums, with um, artistic and cultural organizations. And they bring people together around new ideas that are good for young people. And so I was fortunate, oh geez, probably 10, 15 years ago now, of being connected with some of the educators who were really at the forefront of trying different things, whether in their classroom or at the leadership level, and being able to network with them just kept me pushing to get better because I would talk to somebody in another district and they would say, Oh, you know, Hey, we, we have a, this kind of new lab we're putting in our school or, you know, we bought this new technology and we have this after school program. You should come and check it out. And it was through those very informal conversations, I think to start that we would say, Oh, well, we don't do, can I come to your school district? I want to check out what you guys are doing. And then, you know, you, you come back and you say, I love that. I'm not so sure about that part. Let's work with our team and make it our own. And so I think just that collaborative environment that, that really is fostered through this particular organization has allowed so many educators in this region to connect and think differently about things that, that that's really kind of in my blood at this point. Um, and so everywhere I've gone since that experience, um, has just allowed me to, to think in unique ways and, and try to come up with, whether it's an initiative or a program or an idea, um, you know, if I think it's gonna benefit the kids that I serve, the, ter the teachers that work in our, our school districts, then, then I go for it. I, I love that. I, I love how, basically you, what you just explained is that sometimes innovation is simple, it's started by copying what somebody else has done. Sometimes you go and you see something else and you say, well, I'm gonna make that my own and you just tweak it slightly and now it's, Innovation. I mean, that, that is truly what innovation is. It's taking what somebody else has done and building on it. You, you mentioned the idea of looping and you said, oh, it's a thing from the 90s. But I would challenge that I have four of my own kids. I plan to loop with my kids for 18 years because <laughs> it works. You know, I, you take these ideas that are just common out in the real world and we start to apply them to schools and people start to think they're innovative. And, <laughs> and really, it's just copying what, what others have done. Um, I think that's one of the ways you learn. I mean, you know, so when I, when I wrote my first book, Steam Makers, it was because of all of these other wonderful educators that I was surrounding myself with. And I would take my team of teachers to go visit, you know, somebody was creating a, a Lego space in their school. Well, that's awesome. Let's go take a look at it. Somebody else was uh, working on hydroponics. I don't know anything about hydroponics. Let's go check it out. That's what allowed us to start our makerspace in our school. Um, and we really were able to take the bits and pieces that resonated most with us that we thought would connect for our kids. And that's how we created the space and the programming initially in our school district. But I think it was, you know, it's simple. It's by having conversations with good people around you that make you better. Um, and that's honestly, that's where I get some of my best ideas. So, so let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, your, your current role or even past roles as a, as a principal and 
you know, now the assistant superintendent. So you see these amazing things happening in other places, especially around the ideas of STEAM or STEM, uh, science, project-based learning, makerspaces, the, the whole nine yards. And you see these things through the adult lens of this is absolutely incredible. I'm blown away by this. And you start to think kids everywhere deserve this or should have that opportunity. Do you ever run into programs or even just ideas that you think are absolutely amazing and the school, the community, the staff, whatever, kind of push against it and they say, ooh, that's good for somebody else, but not necessarily for us? Um, or are you in a place where that, that the cultures just bring it? We want to do anything and everything. I think I've seen a little bit of both. Um, you know, when, when STEAM and making started happening in schools, my elementary school started that very early on in the process. Um, and we had teachers who kind of thought, oh, I don't know that that's for me, or I don't teach science, technology, engineering, or math, so that's sort of not my cup of tea. Um, and I think at times, and, and I would love to hear if you kind of agree with this philosophy or not, I mean, I don't need everybody, as a leader, I don't need everybody buying in and jumping on board right away. That's okay with me. I know that I will have a couple key players who will embrace it, figure it out quickly, and run with it. And I love that. I love those superstars and handing those opportunities off to them because I know they're going to do wonderful things. But it's okay if you're the, the next group of teachers that says, you know what, I'm going to tiptoe in a little bit. I'm going to try this out, and I'm going to figure out how, how it works for me. And that's okay, too. You know, I, I don't think there's any educational initiative that 100% of the people are on board with and they're all saying, you know, rah, rah, let's go. And that's all right. I think when it happens more naturally, like a, a grassroots kind of implementation, I think that's better because then every individual that's buying in is doing it on their terms, not on mine. I, you know, I'm not going to dictate what STEM or STEAM or maker or creativity looks like. I'm going to give you some tools and I want you to play and figure out which one of those work best for you because then it's going to be, haha, pun intended here, Dave, it's going to be lasting learning for them because they're going to make it work. That's awesome. And then you're going to go pun intended all in on whatever that is. So, <laughs> um, I, I, no, I, I completely agree with that. And it, part of me feels guilty sharing the, the secret sauce, if you will, for the leadership um, strategy that's used to implement. But um, I, you're, you're spot on. First of all, I don't, I don't ever initiate pilots because I think when people hear pilots, they think that gives them freedom to, to sink it and say it didn't work and just blow it up and say, we're not going to do it. I start with baby steps and that I know full well are going to go to full implementation. And in that initial baby step, I'm looking for the pitfalls that I can try to eliminate before we scale up. But if we're going to try it with a small group, I have full intentions of going bigger and bigger and bigger soon. It's just a matter of me trying to figure out how. And I'm also a believer that, um, yeah, like, like you said, 100% are never going to be all in right away because if that were the case, they would have already been all in. Um, they, they wouldn't need you. You're going to have resistors, but most of the resistors resist simply because they haven't had an opportunity to weigh in on the process. That's it. Sometimes they just want to be able to express their, their opinion and have it be acknowledged. And then they're willing to try things. Teachers are good, good people that always want the best for kids, but they, they also want to be able to advocate for what they believe is best. So give them that voice, give them that platform, and then make your non-negotiables of what will happen. Let them play around with how we get there. So I agree completely with everything you said. And I mean, that's the essence of creativity, right? I agree. And I, I feel like that's why maker spaces, in my opinion, are successful because every learner who enters the doors has a choice about what they want to do, how they want to do it, how they're going to spend their time, who they're going to collaborate with. And, and when I say learners, I don't just mean kids, I mean teachers. When we opened our first maker space in my former school district, I positioned myself every day in that space at lunchtime. Kids would come in, they would work on projects, we would chat, we'd talk about any new materials we brought in, and teachers would walk past and some would stop in, some would sit down, some would just kind of look around, some would keep on walking, but then they'd walk past the next day, maybe the next day, and finally we had piqued their curiosity enough that they would come in or they would say, you know, I, I saw you working with this 
material? What were you guys doing? And slowly they begin to figure out how, how they fit into that process. But I think it's important for us at the leadership level to model some of that. That's why I put myself in that space. Um, we did a similar thing in the district that I'm in right now. We hosted a bunch of summer workshops in, in one of our maker spaces and said, you know what, do you, do you wanna learn how to solder? I, you know, I don't know any expert soldering iron workers, but um, <laughs> our teachers thought, all right, well, that's kind of interesting. I wanna see how this connects to something I could do in my classroom. So we offered this series of activities that were kind of unique and just let them get acclimated with the tools and materials because then they're gonna be more ready to head into that space with their students because they've gained a level of comfort around those same tools. So I think we have to model it and we have to make sure that the learning that is presented there is accessible to everybody. And I think that's spot on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to expand on this a little bit more because I've actually heard people say, yeah, that's all good for that, that space, if you will, for that class, for that hour, whether you have like a project lead the way or little engineers or a STEM-based class, yeah, I, I get it. Let the people play with Legos and um, soldering irons there. But then when you get to the, I'm doing the air quotes for those that can't see me, the real classes, the language arts classes, the math classes, you actually have to follow the script for the sake of, I hate this word, fidelity. We have to make sure that everybody's doing the right things at the right time in the right way. How do you get those two worlds to mesh. I mean, as an assistant superintendent, curriculum instruction, it's like in your wheelhouse. And I'm sure this is a battle you face <laughs> regularly is trying to, to find that balance between allowing the creativity, allowing the autonomy, yet still trying to find that balance between making sure that the right stuff is being presented. Do you have an answer? <laughs> That's a hard one. Well, I mean, here, here's part of my argument. If you walk into a space, whether it's a makerspace, a library, a classroom, if kids are doing things that are hands-on, if they're doing something that is maker related, I guarantee you they're going to be engaged. Kids aren't sitting around with their hands in their laps when you're offering them the opportunity to collaborate, to be creative, to build, to design, to hack something apart. They want that opportunity. And so, I mean, my theory is if we take that and we infuse it into, you know, quote unquote, the real classrooms, then we're going to get that same engagement and our students are going to be so much more involved in that learning. Um, I, that's part of the reason why I wrote the book Remaking Literacy. It's because I went around the country and I talked to educators who said, okay, you know, I like your ideas. I like being able to infuse some creativity into things, but I teach language arts and this stuff has nothing to do with me. And the more I thought about it, I thought they were right. Like we need to find opportunities that language arts teachers can connect literacy to ideas like STEM and STEAM and Maker. And so I wrote that whole book with that idea in mind that I don't want those teachers to feel disenfranchised, that they're not a part of this fun engagement. I want them to be able to pull really practical strategies and doing something hands-on in literacy class is okay. If, if there's something that you can do by bringing in hands-on materials that are gonna make kids comprehend or learn more vocabulary, be able to read more fluently by infusing technology or, or some kind of low-tech tool, I say go for it. So for me, it's about engagement and whether engagement is happening in that special space or it's happening in the regular classroom, it, to me, it doesn't matter what space it's in. It's the fact that we're giving kids something hands-on and tangible. And I feel like most kids, I, I guess I can't say all, but most kids love that. 99% of kids are going to say, well, Sure, I want to use Play-Doh to show my understanding or Legos or cardboard and duct tape. That's, that's this generation of kids. They like to be actively engaged. So um, I yes. think is yes. the answer. Yes. You are like preaching in my educational church right now, JC. This is phenomenal. <laughs> and I don't know if you want to uh, <laughs> equate yourself with being in the, my kind of headspace right now, but you are truly speaking my language right now. You know, I, I think 
I, I want to repeat a bunch of stuff that you said and put my own little spin on it, if that's okay. But the idea that e even in a language arts class, even in a class where reading is the focus, kids don't have to be reading to learn. Reading is a pathway towards learning. It is not the end all be all destination. And I think that's an area that we've missed the boat quite a bit in education as we measure a student's ability to read as opposed to a student's ability to learn. But that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, all lasting learning, to use that line again, is based off of doing, not just sitting. And you think about anything that we do in the real world that has any kind of endurance, walking, talking, riding a bike, I'll go there. You learn it by doing it. Professional athletes don't just sit in a film room, watch the film, and then read the playbook. They get on the field and they do it. Imagine if our, our 16 year olds just had to read the owner's manual for their car and then went out and took a test without having to actually go drive the car. It would be ridiculous. It's the same thing in the real world. The only way to become a better teacher is to teach. The only way to be a better parent is to parent. You've got to go out and do to learn. And that's, that's what the makerspace is all about. It's just get your hands dirty and go do the stuff that we're talking about, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and I think some people are, I think some of the barrier around that is it's risky, right? I mean, I'll use the example we were talking with the soldering iron. I mean, that's not an everyday tool. And yes, there's an element of danger there. But even if we were talking about cardboard and duct tape, there's a sense of you know what, I don't know what kids are going to make with these materials. I don't know what the outcome is going to look like. And so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to give over control to something that is so open-ended. And I think slowly but surely, teachers are losing that fear because they're seeing that kids are grabbing this opportunity and coming up with phenomenal things, whether it's something they're inventing or you know a project they're partnering on. Um, I think that that learning by doing can be scary for teachers. You know, you're kind of jumping into a situation where there's a bit of unknown and it doesn't necessarily follow the lesson plan. And it, it might, God forbid, hit a standard you didn't intend it to hit on, right? I mean, who knows what the outcome will be, but we have to be okay with that. Um, and again, I, I go back to engagement. If, if our kids are engage in something and they're collaborating and discussing and it's all focused on this thing that they're making i guarantee you there's a heck of a lot learn of learning going on in there that maybe standards don't even measure well the last word you said there measure i think that is truly the essence of the fear that's out there right now and it's it's the fault of people like like me like i'll say like you positionally that mm -hmm. that create that fear for teachers we've we've made teachers feel like if they can't cleanly measure it, if they can't cleanly grade it, if they can't connect a dot between what they're doing in their class and how a student might perform on some big state standardized test in May, then it's off limits. And it has to be this, this clear line that they can see and then they can turn around and they can explain to people like us so that when we pop into the rooms with our little rubrics in hand to evaluate their effectiveness, we can say, got it, don't got it. That's the fear. And that mess that we see in, in the making and the projects, that's, that's not necessarily clean. It's not a got it, don't got it, it's getting it. And it's a process. And that's the intimidating thing. And we've got teachers now to the place where some of them are truly fearful of their, their job or their evaluation ratings or whatever the case may be because we have put these, these processes in place. We put them in these boxes that they don't know how to fight their way out of. And that's become the safe place. So. I, I own that and I appreciate you sharing some of this because it's making me reflect and think through what I'm doing. And maybe it's think, making other administrators think through <laughs> their, their ability to, to, freely, to truly free up people and give people permission to get messy because it's, it's okay. I mean, there has to be a purpose behind it. Don't get me wrong. We're not saying anarchy, just go do what you want to do, throw scissors and duct tape at the kids all day. <laughs> there has to be a purpose, but it's okay for it to be messy and for you to be learning through the process. Well, and so, think about those skills and dispositions that kids are learning when they engage in that type of work, right? I mean, there's been this huge push for like, you know, habits of mind and perseverance and striving for accuracy and thinking flexibly and all those things that we know we want for our students. We know that that's critical if they're going to be global citizens of the world, right? But 
those are measured on the test. So we're, we're often hesitant to give those a ton of value in school because we don't measure those. You know, how, how can I measure your level of perseverance or your ability to be creative? And, and I know there are, there are some rubrics and things out there that do that, but not in the formal sense that we measure math achievement, right? So it, it does look a little messier, but those are still things that we value greatly and those are some of the maybe unintended outcomes of this type of learning that I think are huge for, for young people. Um, but, but I will say, I will share a story about how I believe this does impact formal achievement. Um, in my former school, I had uh, a fifth grade math team who uh, they weren't quite sure that they could go into this work. They were a little hesitant. And in the state of Pennsylvania, fifth grade is kind of like the grade, you know, they, we, start, we start standardized testing in third grade, but a lot of things are based on the fifth grade scores. And, and the teachers took, you know, they were very proud of their accomplishments and they wanted to hold strong to that. Um, but they decided to take some math concepts and put them into something that was a bit more project based. And I said, go for it. If it means that your scores drop this year, that's okay. I, I'm not going to be mad at you. I want to see what happens with kids. And they created opportunities for students to do things in a hands-on way that did measurement and geometry and critical thinking and all the math skills that needed to happen for their grade level. And the kids rocked it. I mean, it was amazing the things that they came up with. And guess what? At the end of the school year, their test scores were phenomenal. And it wasn't because we were drilling standards or taking test prep you know, quizzes. It was because we gave them something real and authentic. They created these projects in a collaborative manner. They shared it with an authentic audience. And that built skills that was gonna take them far beyond fifth grade. And you know, it's not a research study or, or anything of that caliber. But to me, that was proof that going outside the box and trying something that you know is best for kids is still going to have the results that you're banking on. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, you and I are peers. The other people listening to this are peers. It is now a peer reviewed study. So yes, it is research. <laughs> it's anecdotal, but it is peer reviewed research now. And I'll, I'll argue the same thing. So I just said, I've been in seven different schools uh, and six different districts. And some of these districts have been high achieving. Some have been, um, historically struggling schools by assessment results. And I can tell you emphatically that in each of those schools, in each of those districts, the teachers that do a lot of the test prep, worksheets, drill and kill, we gotta get the kids ready, their scores stagnate. Those that say, forget about it, we're just gonna try something different, those are the ones that see tremendous success. Uh, you've gotta be willing to just go out and do something different and try. It, seriously, it's, we're, we're worried about changing destinies and generations here. You can't be chasing a test score in May. So that's, that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> well, but in the example that you gave, I mean, think about the difference. Let, like, you know, here's, here's two classrooms. In classroom A, we do a lot of test prep and the teacher plans these very standards driven lessons and, you know, maybe even uses a, a prescriptive kind of program and step march through the school year, right? Very intent on those test scores. Then you have teacher B who maybe designs some other kinds of experiences that also hit on the standards, but maybe does it through project-based learning or maker education or some other format. Which group of students is doing the thinking? The kids who are marching through the test prep, I, I guarantee you they're probably not doing a lot of critical thinking or independent thinking or collaborative thinking for that matter. But if you look at the classrooms where teachers are creating things that are maybe a little more open-ended, that require a lot more of those soft skills, even though I really hate that term, those are the kids who are thinking because they're out there figuring it out. They're not just consuming those, those worksheets or those test preps. They're, they're out there making connections between math and science and English and social studies and and truly, you know, you're talking about, you know, teaching for the generations. That's what's going to help those kids beyond the school walls is when we set them up to think for themselves. 
That's it. We, we need to start creating more thinkers and less knowers. It's not about what you know on test day. It's your ability to keep thinking beyond the tests, beyond the degrees, beyond the certifications, create people that want to keep going back and getting those degrees and certificates and keep writing the books and keep doing the things because that's what it's all about. That's what creates evolution within society. That's what creates innovation within society. If we create a bunch of people that simply know all the stuff there is to know right now, then our world doesn't change, doesn't get any better. It's just, we all know what it is. We need to create people that are curious, inquisitive, and want to keep growing. And um, that's something, again, you can't measure in May. You can only measure that 10, 15, 20 years from now. So go out there and do all you can to, to have that as your, your goal and your mindset, not what happens in May. So, so JC, um, I got to ask, how many, first of all, how many books have you written? I, I'm familiar with three of them, but you've already mentioned one that I wasn't even familiar with. How many books have you written? I've written five. Holy cow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Steam Makers was my first book. Okay. Um, and, well, I'm trying to think of, uh, in, in publishing order, I don't know, but the next book that I wrote was Remaking Literacy, again, okay. which was in response. Yeah. Um, I also wrote a book for ISTE called Connect to Lead, which is all about the importance of building a learning network. Um, for me personally, that has helped me to learn and grow. You know, we're talking about not being stagnant. Um, I could, I could be a knower, right. And just pretend that I know everything and stay confined to my own space. But I choose to be connected because I feel like the other people around me push me to think, and that's what helps me to grow. Um, and if I didn't have that, I, I don't know where I would be. Um, so I write a lot about that in connect to lead. Um, and then as, as you know, I've had this wonderful connection with the amazing people at Edge and Match Publishing. Um, and I connected with Sarah, oh, a couple years ago through Ed Camp Voice. And we started having a conversation. I told her there were some ideas that I had. And so she published uh, Unlock Creativity. And my most recent endeavor with my good buddy, Kristen Nan, who I know you just talked to recently as well. Uh, and we wrote the book All In, which is, um, an interesting take, I think, on some educational issues because we present it from two very different lenses, uh, one of a classroom teacher and one of a school administrator. It's fascinating just as you're talking through that timeline, just to see how the things that you feel like writing about or that are on the, the edge of your, your rank, you can kind of see that evolution kind of take place both through your career and your thought process. Um, which of those projects was the most difficult for you to, to wrap your, your brain around? Maybe that's not even one you can, you can answer, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it with that. Which one was the most difficult? Which one was the biggest, the biggest challenge? Um, well, I think it's a hard question. Um, full disclosure, um, I had some challenges, um, getting some one of those books published um mm. you know like any writer will tell you right. i had some rejection and that was hard right um, it was hard for me to kind of handle and um regroup and get back on the right track uh, and so that's that was a difficult challenge but i i don't know um it was I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause on that because yeah. i think that's something that a lot of people don't recognize that it happens you know i think Right, especially right now in the age that we're in, in educational publishing, I think people feel like, well, anybody can just write a book and get it published. I, I will tell you as well, I have been rejected by multiple publishers for, for my books. You just heard JC say it. It, it, it happens and it doesn't mean they're bad ideas. Sometimes it's just the publishers already got something along that lines in the wheelhouse, um, something in the pipeline, maybe it just doesn't fit with their voice, but it happens. But look at you with, five books now in your repertoire you're like yeah i'm getting back on that horse i'm going let's let's do this so keep going i, I didn't mean to cut you off but I, I just think that's a powerful lesson no i agree with you and i don't think that authors talk about that very often uh, maybe authors in like you know fictional you know novel writers will say that you know they sent their manuscript a thousand places um i don't think in educational publishing we do talk about that enough and say you know yeah, you, you see a lot of educators who are putting out their stories. And I think that's a great thing because again, I can learn so much by reading and connecting with the work of others. Um, but it is the reality that every publisher is not going to be the best match for you. And you might not have the right project for what their focus is. And that's okay. 
you'll find the place that will support and lift up your voice. Um, and I think every author's space may be a little bit different and that's okay. Um, you know, I, I feel like I have, I know it sounds cliche, but I really truly feel like I have found a family in Edge Match. We talk about that all the time, you know, Edge Match family, but it's true because I feel like those are the people who support me. And I mean, professionally and personally, you know, I'm reaching out to a number of those authors every single day. I was just talking to Rochelle today. I was texting Mandy yesterday. And those are, those are my people. Um, and so I think for me, finding, finding a home at Edge Match um, just felt right. Um, you know, I feel like everybody there kind of cares about one another and that has been a great support system. Um, and, and that's why, you know, Kristen and I went to Sarah and said, you know what, we have this idea. It, it maybe is a little unconventional. Um, you know, there aren't a whole lot of, of books out there that really talk about things from two very different points of view. And she said, go for it. Um, and, and that, I will say, you know, working with another author was a challenge. You know, I, I wrote four books on my own. So, you know, it's, it's your, your baby, right? And you're working with an editor and that's the feedback that you're getting and you're making your revisions or, um, but being accountable to another person that you care about and who is your, your friend and navigating that as a co-author, it was hard. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not sure what Kristen's opinion is on that, but you know, we, we struggled. And I think to be honest, our, the foundation of our friendship was what got us through some of the, the writing challenges that we had. Um, because I think we have a great deal of trust for each other, a great deal of respect, and we just had to figure out how did this work as a partnership as opposed to a solo writing project. I, I think it's, th that whole story is super, super cool. I mean, the, the actual book is amazing as well, but the, the, when you know like the backstory um, behind it, it's like the behind the music thing, you know? Um, when you get to see the, the behind the scenes um, process, it's fascinating because I don't know that I would be capable of writing a book like, like you and Kristen did. I'll just put that out there. Um, you know, you talked about your, your edu match family and that peel in that you have and the vast majority of that group with, I believe the exception of one is from outside of your district. Um, it's from people that, and the vast majority are outside of your state. We'll add Rochelle into your, your state group as well. Um, but it's, it's people with, with reaches all across the country. And I have found, I'll personalize this for me, that sometimes it's easier to, to lead the change with people that you don't work with on a day-to-day -day basis, to try to um, drive the conversation forward, or I'll, I'll use the term poke the bear, whatever the case may be, with others that I don't have to rub shoulders with day in and day out. I find myself being more cautious with the people I work with day in and day out. Maybe, that, maybe that's just completely me. I can't imagine sitting down with somebody that I work with daily and saying, hey, let's write a book where we can kind of challenge each other. You tell me your perspective, I'll tell you my perspective. I'll tell you where you're wrong, you tell me where I'm wrong. And we'll just write about it in this completely symbiotic way and wrap our arms around each other at the end of the day and say, let's go out and have a drink. I can't imagine that. I mean, how, how did this, how did that relationship first form between the two of you where you thought, yeah, we, we can do this and we'll survive it? I don't, I'm not sure how that evolved. Um, but I'm definitely the kind of administrator that gets into classrooms every chance I get. Um, I, like right now I'm in one of our elementary schools where I keep an office and I play principal a couple days a week because I want to be close to kids. I want to be where my teachers are. Um, and it's not in the same building as Kristen, but, um, but that's just a part of my practice. I want to be in classrooms. And so when I started in this role, I would pop into classrooms often. And we tell the story in, in our book, All In, where I went into her classroom one day and just said, like, what are you working on? Like, tell me what you want to do for kids this year. And she kind of looked at me, you know, like I had three heads and she was like, what is this woman for real? Like, she's asking me what I want for my classroom. And I think it started from there, like the fact that I was just so upfront and asked her about something that I knew she was, I mean, she was, she's had 
23 years in the school district. So, you know, she has a reputation for being a passionate, effective educator. So, I mean, did I go in and maybe purposely push a few buttons? Sure. Um, but that also let her know that, that I'm real and that it's okay to push my buttons back. And I think we just kind of, it, it really evolved from there. Um, you know, we, we joke about, we use Voxer a lot, just her and I will side Vox and, and I know I'm getting ready for a big one when she's, you know, leaving me five minute boxes about things, but, you know, she'll tell me something that's on her mind that's district related, like, tell me about this decision, why, you know, help me understand why this is happening, or, you know, I don't know that this process is working, have you guys ever thought about this? Um, and we've been able to kind of challenge each other in ways that, you know, it's not, it's not aggressive, but it's definitely pushing the thinking. And I think we both respect the fact that that's the only way we're going to get better. I mean, I could listen to her concerns and go, oh, okay, well, I'm the administrator and we're going to do it this way. Or I could say, you're absolutely right. I need to rethink this practice or this initiative. And, and I, I missed the teacher perspective here. And I have to be big enough to go, you know what, like my ideas aren't always the best ideas. And if I don't pull other people into that process, I'm stagnant, right? Like I'm not growing. And then in turn, my district isn't growing because I'm not opening up to those kinds of ideas. So, um, you know, having her and other just tremendous educators who are willing to be open and vulnerable in turn, I am open and vulnerable with them. And I feel like that's where we've made our greatest accomplishments in the last couple of years that I've been here in the district. I think there are teachers listening to this everywhere saying, Ooh, I want you to be my administrator. Or can you just come and have a conversation with my administrator? <laughs> Which, because I mean, your style, what you're saying, I know it's not just words. This is because Kristen said it too. <laughs> and she would be real. What you, what you are is the epitome of, of leadership. It's not wagging the finger and saying, do it my way. It's standing beside people saying, let me guide you. Let me help you get where you need to be. It's just, it's so powerful. And I love that you are true. You're literally sitting in an office right now that you said is in an elementary school that you kind of just make your own. That is so stinking cool. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. I want to be you. I think that, that just sums up. I want to be you. Forget about everybody else wanting it. I, I want to be you and, and do what you're doing. We can do a job swap. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down. Absolutely. <laughs> That'd be cool. So, so what's next for you? I don't know. Is that crazy? I don't know. Um, you, you I, realize I don't believe that for a minute. You know that, right? No, it's true. Really? Um, so I, I mentioned my, my friend, Rochelle. Um, so in the fall of 2018, Rochelle and I were both writing three books at the same time. Right, so that's kind of how our, this crazy publishing outburst <laughs> happened. Um, it's just the timing. Um, we were presented these contracts all pretty um, one month apart from one another. And her and I were talking like, should we do this? Are we crazy doing all this writing? Um, but this, this particular period of time in the fall, we just were, were writing furiously. And now all of these books are out. And I think we're kind of taking a breather. Although if you know Rochelle, you know she's not taking a breather. She's probably writing 10 more books. Um, but right now I'm really enjoying traveling and talking to educators about some of these books and about some of the ideas that I think are so important about meeting with educators um, and, and changing classroom practice to really impact our students, but also to the point talking with leadership. Um, going around and talking to school district leadership teams and, and figuring out how they can implement some strategies to move their schools forward. Um, and so I, I'm, I don't have any writing projects right now, but I've been doing a lot of speaking and that's really fun. I, I've really enjoyed doing that. That's cool. That's cool. I can't wait to connect with you in, in person and, and hear all of your, your wisdom face to face with, without a computer between us. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um, so I got to ask you, and I warned you that this was going to be coming. So you've got so much that, that you're doing, so much that you believe, you're passionate about so much for the betterment of kids and for adults for that matter. 
but I wrap up every podcast by asking people to identify their mic drop moment because so much truth gets sprinkled throughout these 30, 40 minutes. And I think sometimes people just get completely overwhelmed. Like, Oh my gosh, I want to remember that. I want to remember that. I want to remember that. So I try to wrap it all up at the very end and say, okay, pull over, focus in, um, turn your headphones up. This is that mic drop moment. So JC, if you had the opportunity, which you do to speak to the entire world right now and say, this is the thing, what is your thing? I think the most important takeaway is whatever the thing is that you've been thinking about doing. If you're a classroom teacher and you've been thinking about uh, a, a different lesson, a different way to approach a topic, if you're a building principal and you wanna try a new initiative, if you're a central office administrator and you have some nugget, some great idea, just take the risk and do it. I think we all have to take the chance to make that difference. And if we're not taking a gamble on something, then we're just, we're just kind of living in the status quo. And um, so I think the biggest thing that I would want people to do is take that risk, whatever it is that you've been thinking about, that little idea that you've been scribbling in your notebook, go for it. What's the worst that can happen? I love that. I'm going to, I'll take that a step further. And the visual I just got in my head, you know, you talked a lot about engagement early on and how engagement requires that risk. I think about like the real world outside of educational space, when we think about engagement, oftentimes involves this guy getting down on a knee, taking this risk. The whole world's thinking this could go epically great or it could go horribly wrong, but you got to take the risk or the engagement will never take place. So tomorrow in your classroom, proverbially get down on that knee and take a risk. What's the worst thing that could happen? You go find somebody else, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So JC, thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is a crazy busy day um, to share so much wisdom and truth in your story and your journey with all of us. I personally benefited from this a ton and I guarantee the listeners did as well. I'm so glad. Thanks for the opportunity, Dave.